This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey everyone, CJ here. This time we are going to take a look at the rise of the Tibetan Empire and their fearsome high altitude warriors. The Tibetans are often depicted in the media as pacifist Buddhist monks. But over a thousand years ago, between the 7th and the 9th century, they had a mighty empire that rivaled the Chinese Tang Dynasty, Western Turkic Khaganate, and the Arabian Caliphates. They were one of the biggest players in the global stage. Until their empire crumbled. In this episode, we are going to take a look at the rise and fall of the Tibetan Empire. The early Tibetan Empire was a seminal period in Tibetan history. It is the time when they first entered the world stage, established their culture, started writing down their history, and most importantly, made Buddhism the empire's official religion. This period was punctuated by three illustrious leaders, Tsongsen Gampo, Trisong Detsen, and Ralpa Chan of the Yarlung dynasty. Together, they were collectively known as the Three Dharma Kings. They were given this title not just because of their military prowess, but also because of their contribution in the propagation of Buddhism and the developments of Tibetan culture. Written Tibetan history only started during Songsen Gampo's reign. He was the 33rd ruler of the Yarlung dynasty. So there was a long line of Yarlung kings before him. What I'm about to tell you is the origin myth of the Tibetans according to Mani Kabum, a collection of Buddhist teachings and practices attributed to Songsen Gampo. But historians think that it could have been written much later. Even though this is a mythical interpretation of their origin, I think it is important to talk about this because it illustrates how they perceived their connection to their patron bodhisattva and the surrounding civilizations. Even though they are both important, as students of history, we need to be able to separate cultural narrative and history and look at things objectively. To assess information rationally, it is going to be beneficial for us to build our logical foundation. Luckily, our sponsor for this video, Brilliant, can help you build your foundation in quantitative and analytical skills with the courses they provide. Brilliant have tons of interactive courses in logic and maths, providing you with hands-on and challenging ways to learn. These courses can help you visualize and develop your intuition for tough concepts while fostering long-term commitments to learning. Best of all, it provides a low-pressure environment for you to learn at your own pace. So if you feel like checking out other courses they provide, such as science and computer science, you can also do that. And once you're done, you can go back to your original course. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org or click on the link in the description. The first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Okay, now let's get into the myth. According to Mani Kabum, the ancestor of the Tibetans was a monkey an incarnation of the Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara, also known as Guan Ying in Chinese and Kanon in Japanese. The land of snow is another name for Tibet. A long time ago, he went there because it had not been graced by Buddha's teaching yet. The term Bodhisattva means a Buddha who could have gone to Nirvana but decided to stay to help other suffering beings. At the time, humans did not exist yet, so his plan was to actually save all living beings. One day, a female demon, a rock Raksashi, tried to seduce the monkey. At first, she failed, but then she decided to blackmail the monkey, saying that if he refused her, she would have copulated with Raksashas, and her descendants would wreak havoc all over the land of snow and destroy all life. Not knowing what to do, the monkey sought the guidance of his previous incarnation, Avalokitesvara, and he was advised to marry the Raksashi because his descendants would become the first humans and support the Dharma, or the truth in the context of Buddhism. Eventually, his descendants would spread all over the land, with some going to India, others going to China, and some went to an unknown place called Mor. Meanwhile, the Tibetans settled in a land to the southeast of Lhasa. After some time, the Yarlung dynasty was established in the Yarlung Valley of Tibet, and their first king was Nyatri Senpo. But this is just according to the traditional account. Since there are not enough evidence to prove his existence, he is usually considered as a legendary figure by historians. From this narrative, we can see that the Tibetans see the surrounding civilization as their distant relatives. 
the Tibetans would only start writing their history during the reign of Songsen Gampo, the 33rd Senpo of the Yalong dynasty. He literally ordered the creation of the Tibetan scripts during his reign. But that happened a little later in his career. He had to first make his mark by defeating the neighboring kingdom of Sangsung to the northwest and gain their submission. The kingdom of Sangsung actually had a longer history than the Yalong dynasty, and it is the land of origin for the Tibetan folk religions that was widely practiced before Buddhism was brought in. Some people call this ancient belief Bung religion, but to be more accurate, it is a prehistoric form of Bung. The Bung religion as we know it today was actually developed later. The arrival of Buddhism etched out prehistoric Bung, not without resistance of course, as it competed and was also influenced by it. In turn, Bon was also influenced by Buddhism and became the Eternal Bon, which was developed around the 10th or 14th century, and the New Bon was developed in the 14th century. It was around this period in the 630s when he sent students to India to master the writing system. They will return in a couple of decades to create the Tibetan script. Then, Songchen Gampo turned his attention to the northeast and fought against the Aza kingdom. They were also known as the Tuyuhuns to the Chinese. At the time, the Tuyuhuns were in conflict with both Tang and Tibet. So in 634, Songchen Gampo sent an envoy to the newly established Chinese Tang dynasty. Not much is known about the content of the message. It could be a request for alliance or who knows. So the war against the Aza continued, and in 635, it was mostly crushed by the Tang army. So soon after, Songsen Gampo sent an envoy to request marriage alliance with the Chinese. But the request was denied, and the Tibetan envoy was offended that his counterpart from the Western Turkic Khaganate and even the defeated Azas were treated better than him. And their marriage alliance requests were the ones that were approved. Slighted by this incident, Songsen Gampo ordered an attack on the Azas, and after that, he recruited the local Chiang tribes and launched an attack on the Chinese frontier city of Songzhou, which is located in Sichuan today. He defeated the initial Tang forces, and then this is where history from the two sides diverged a bit. According to the Tibetan version, the Tang emperor Tang Taizong capitulated and sent him a princess. But in the Chinese version, they sent a second contingent and ambushed the Tibetans with a night raid. After suffering a minor defeat, the Tibetans retreated and sent an envoy to request for a princess again in 640. This time, he sent his general and prime minister, Gar Tongsen Yulsung, who brought plenty of gifts with him. He apologized and smoothed things over. The Chinese emperor of the time, Tang Taizong, was so impressed by him, he even offered another princess to marry off to him, which the latter declined. Eventually, Tang Taizong sneakily elevated a distant niece as a princess and sent her off to marry Songsen Gampo. But while she was on her way, Songsen Gampo helped a Nepalese prince regain his throne from an uncle who usurped it, and he married a Nepalese princess as his first wife. So the Chinese princess Wen Cheng became a lower-ranked wife. The thing about history is that there are always contradictory accounts from two sides, so we may never really know the truth of the events. Nevertheless, the fact that the Tang dynasty never attacked Tibet throughout the rest of Tongsen Gampo's reign says a lot about the prowess of the Tibetans. They were just built different, quite literally. Most of the common Tibetans were not the sedentary monks you see in popular media. While some commoners farm barley, most of them are pastoralists who live their lives like steppe nomads, herding yaks, goats, and other livestock. In general, pastoralists have higher protein intake compared to sedentary population from the meat and butter coming from their livestock. Not only that, the Tibetans have evolved to adapt to high-altitude life. The air on the Himalayan ranges is very thin of oxygen. Lowlanders would have difficulty traveling, let alone fighting for this kind of environment. But it is not a hindrance to the Tibetans. So for the following decades, the Chinese, Turks, and the Arabs could not win against the Tibetans when fighting them on their high altitude home ground. Nevertheless, like all empires do, the Tibetan Empire would eventually collapse. Why? You will find out soon enough. Through the rest of Songsen Gampo's reign, he dedicated himself to the development of Buddhism. The Buddhism brought to Tibet was influenced by both Indian and Chinese versions of Mahayana Buddhism. 
Tibetan scripts was created after the students he sent to India returned and he finished his conquest of Samsung and incorporated into his own empire before the end of his reign. On another note, an interesting episode happened during his reign in 648. In a previous episode, I covered the story of the Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang and how he won the debate held by the northern Indian emperor Harsha. Since the return of Xuanzang, the Tang dynasty and Harsha's empire had been in correspondence with each other. And when the Tang dynasty sent an envoy to Harsha's empire in India, he discovered that the emperor had died and he was attacked by the new ruler. So he ran away to Tibet and Songsen Gampo provided him with the Tibetan and Nepalese army to defeat and capture the new ruler. Relationship between Tibet and China was good during that time. Things started to change after Songsen Gampo died. His son only reigned shortly after him, and his infant grandson soon became the 35th Senpo of the Yarlung dynasty. His prime minister and regent was the capable Kartongsen. During this period, the Tibetans allied themselves with a faction of the Western Turkic Khaganate, while the other Turkic factions became a vassal of the Tang dynasty. So the two groups fought against each other to control a lucrative section of the Silk Road. This rivalry between the Tibetans and the Chinese would last for the rest of the Tibetan Empire. The Tibetans would also sometimes ally themselves with the neighboring forces, such as the Arabian Caliphates against the Chinese. And at other times, they would also fight the Arabs too. A century later, in 755, the second of the three Dharma kings, Trisong Detsen, the 38th Senpo, reigned over the empire. Coincidentally, it was right at the start of the devastating An Lu Sun's Rebellion, or An Si Ziluan. China was completely devastated by this rebellion, and the incident would mark a long downward decline of Tibet's neighbor. In 763, Trisong Detsen capitalized on this and started conquering Chinese territory bit by bit, until he launched a surprise attack and rode into Chang'an, the capital of Tang Dynasty. China was so disorganized at the time, its generals refused to come to help the emperor. So the Chinese emperor Taizong escaped the capital. The Tibetans then made the emperor's brother the new emperor and made him sign a tribute treaty before retreating themselves. Taizong quickly recovered his throne and exiled his brother. But the Tang dynasty at the time was in no position to retaliate. So in 783, an actual peace treaty was negotiated and China gave Tibet control over all the land in the present-day Qinghai region. I will talk about the collapse of the Tang dynasty in the next episode, but for now, let's go back to Trisong Detsen. This Senpo was a great follower of Buddhism. He famously held the Samye debate between Indian and Chinese Buddhist traditions, which lasted for over two years. The Indian tradition emerged victorious. However, not everyone in Tibet was into Buddhism. Many of the ministers and aristocrats still supported the indigenous Tibetan religion, and they didn't like what was happening to their religion one bit. This internal religious conflict is an omen for the troubles to come. Eventually, Trisong Detsen's grandson, Ralpachan, became the 41st Senpo of Tibet. He is the third Dharma king. As China declined, Tibet rose under him and reached its greatest extent. He won multiple battles against the Tang dynasty, and eventually, it had to sign another treaty with the Tibetans in 822. Three steles commemorating this treaty was erected in the following year. Like his grandfather, Ralpachan was a great supporter of Buddhism. He even passed a law that each Buddhist monk shall be supported by seven households. His elder brother, Lang Dharma, however, was an anti-Buddhist who resented the fact that the throne was given to his younger brother. According to Tibetan sources, Lang Dharma then plotted with some pro bon ministers to get rid of his brother's supporters one by one, before finally assassinating the Senpo himself by strangulation. According to Chinese sources, however, Ralpachan died of illness, which corroborated another account that there was an epidemic in the region at the time. But whatever was the real cause of Ralpachan's death, it all led to the same outcome. Lang Dharma took the throne after him and proceeded to nearly destroy Buddhism in Tibet. Temples were sealed, monks were ordered to follow Bong, marry, or become hunters. In the area around central Tibet, Buddhism was virtually wiped out. Obviously, this didn't make him a popular man. So one day in the year 842, 
a Buddhist monk came before him with a bow and arrow and assassinated the last Senpo of the Tibetan Empire. The monk then escaped by disguise. He turned his clothes inside out and cleaned his horse that was darkened by charcoal. With the death of Langdarma, Tibet entered the era of fragmentation as the various descendants of the last Tibetan Senpo and other challengers fight for power against each other. The once mighty Tibetan Empire, which remained unchallenged by external force to the end, ironically collapsed from within due to infighting. In a few hundred years, in the 13th century, the Mongols will ride in and the land will be reunited by force. Alright, that's the story of the mighty Tibetan Empire. If you like this kind of cool history, then be sure to subscribe to the channel, because there's a lot more to come. Before I go, I would also like to thank all our patrons on Patreon for supporting this channel. Until next time, stay cool my bros!